everybody. Welcome back to another wonderful episode of Ichabod's House. We are super excited to be here. Um, I'm Andy, along with my co-host, Jen. Hi, everybody. And we are on the second part of a two-part series of Des or Dennis Nilsson, the um, serial killer from the UK. Mm. I don't know why he goes by Des. It's not really short for Dennis. Well, I think we can agree he he hasn't made good judgments or, you know, (laughs) he's not exactly a logical individual. (laughs) This is true. This is true. So um, our episode for you today is called uh, Serial Killer or Dream Date, which he could, you know, in some circles, he could be a really good time. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Um, Okay. So we don't have any Google and Beyond, I don't believe. I don't think so. Uh, so we'll just get right into Ichabod's nose. And this time, this week, I was able to pick Stranger Things first. I called dibs. Um, because I finished season four. Okay, Andy. Way to hog Stranger Things. (laughs) It's my pick as well. Uh. I yelled at the TV almost the entire last hour of the last episode. Yes. I yelled at the TV. Did you do that as well? I was like yes i was very disappointed the thing i like about stranger things is it is so character driven i love all those people every one of them every one of them every single one i agree i yelled at all of them not in a bad way not like they were doing something wrong but i was cheering for them i was yelling at them with them for them the whole gamut such a good cast And yes. Oh my God. So good. So it's a twofer. We both pick them. Uh, We do have a winner, which we will announce the names of all our winners at the, on the last episode. Uh, But you may know who you are. You will be getting a message through Facebook from (laughs) us, from Ichabod's house. Or you might not know who you are. Um, We're not really sure what voices go on inside your head. But if you do get a message from us, whether you know who you are or not, that means you're a winner. Is that what you want to say? That's exactly what I want to say. <laughs> I'm a bit under the weather this morning. I have not I know, had I'm any so topical sorry. medication, but I'm feeling like I did. Uh, so if I seem a little hoarse, a little distracted, anything along those lines, let me know. I promise Mr. or Ms. Winner, you'll be getting an email from us. And you, by the time you listen to this and it's posted, you will already know. But we're not going to list all of the names of the winners until the uh, after the last planner has been mailed out. Uh, are we doing this for anticipation's sake? Uh, yes. We are. <laughs> Maybe you need to take some cold medicine. I do need to take some cold medicine. A lot of cold medicine. I'm just saying. Maybe we maybe we just need to go ahead and take that take that leap off that cliff and take some. <laughs> I don't even think I have any. <laughs> I've taken it for granted that I've been around sick people with and COVID patients and you know upper respiratory patients for so long the last couple of years. I've just felt pretty bulletproof. And I woke up this morning. I was like, my throat's really sore and scratchy. I don't feel very good. Hmm. I guess it's time for me to catch a cold. You know what you did? You jinxed yourself. Yeah, you jinxed yourself because we just talked about this yesterday or the day before, how you were feeling pretty bulletproof. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and sort our sources. Sort. We're going to sort our sources or cite them today for this episode and last week's episode. Uh, Wikipedia. Of course, the Netflix documentary Memories of a Murderer, the Nilsson Tapes, which is very interesting. I shall just say that's a, that's an understatement that it's interesting. Um, newspaper articles from the Sun paper in London, Timetoast.com and the Daily Mail in uh, the United Kingdom. You've done a lot of work on this. Dennis Nilsson and I, we'd be BFFs by Christmas if he wasn't dead. This is true. I'm just saying. All right. Yeah. Well, last week we introduced you to Dennis Nilsson, the notorious serial killer in London. His killing spree lasted between 1978 and 1983. 
He chose young, gay, or homeless men who he felt society wouldn't miss. And he was right. We also discussed several of the victims, most of them unidentified. In one of the documentaries on Dennis Nilsson, uh, one of the inspectors stated, usually you have a dead body and you need to find out who the killer is. Here, we have the killer and we have to find the bodies. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Dennis claimed to have killed 15 or 16 young men, but he was only convicted of 12 murders. Eight victims have been identified. At least another six have not. There were at least three times that a victim escaped and police were informed of what happened, yet no one stopped Dennis. Oh, God. You know, I just hate the homophobia and assholery that went on and still goes on. It still does, right? Thank God it's not as prevalent. It's not in every household. It's not with every person. I think we as a society, as human beings, have actually made some decent progress. I don't think we've made near enough, Mm -hmm. um, but some decent progress to where at least crimes are um, investigated now uh, for some some demographics of society, right? Mm -hmm. Others still kind of go swept underneath the rug, um, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, it's, and at the end, we'll talk about a, a series that just came out in the UK, um, a dramatic limited series that they did, um, about, about this and the people now, you know, are just outraged at the police's response, but they just have to remember that back at that time in the UK and really, I mean, in America as well. Yeah, it was legal, but it was not accepted mm-hmm. in any form or fashion. Right. And people did not, if you were gay, you did not want to tell anybody. You didn't want anyone to know. And um, if your family found out, they didn't want anybody to know that they had a gay mm-hmm. child or a gay brother or I- anyone. So they just kind of excommunicated you. You were gone. You were just vacated from the family and the home and everything. And so, but but not all of his victims were gay. Um, some of them were just, were homeless. Um, so one guy, one of the survivors, and we'll get into talk about him, he actually was married um, and just met up with, with Dennis just as, a, you know, just being chummy, just, you know, like f- friends or whatever, and we're just hanging out. So not all of them were gay, not all of them were homeless, but that was, the majority were both. So, okay. So we told you last week mm-hmm. about how in November of 1980, a man named Douglas Stewart escaped. Oh, that's him. The guy that was married. A man named Douglas Stewart escaped Dennis, Dennis's grasp and went straight to the police. The police questioned Dennis, of course, but Dennis chalked it up to a lover's quarrel, which gave the police at the time the heebie-jeebies. Unfortunately, the police were so homophobic that they did nothing about it. Mm. And I think he was like the third, oh. second or third. Well, victim not murder victim obviously because he's he lived but had they had they done something at that time and listened to what he said and searched his apartment done something all the Mm -hmm. others wouldn't have happened you would think yeah the body count would have been a lot lower right for sure yeah well there were a few other victims who got away that we want to tell you about the first was a student from hong kong named andrew ho Nilsson met Andrew at St. Martin's Lane Pub and lured him into his apartment. It was there, with the help of 1970s superstar country singer Anne Murray. I told you, Andy. I know. That Nilsson was able to set the mood for murder. Although, I, if I was Nilsson, I would have chosen something other than a Canadian pop star like Anne Murray. I would have chosen something a little more local for Mr. Ho. I'm just saying. So I'm guessing Ho was a disco guy. He probably would have liked some Bee Gees, I'm guessing. You think so? Early 80s. Yep. He would have liked some Bee Gees, I'm guessing. That could be, for sure. All right. After a few drinks, Dennis attempted to strangle Andrew. But wait, Andrew escaped and reported the incident to the police. They interviewed Dennis. However, Andrew decided not to press charges. And one could assume because of the backlash that he would get if that was made public. Of course, absolutely. Which is understandable. Yeah. It was after this attempted murder of Andrew Ho that he stumbled upon Canadian student Kenneth Ockenden and successfully murdered him. We touched on that last week. Kenneth was Dennis's third victim. After Kenneth, there would be four more unidentified victims and another attempted murder. 
Last episode, we also discussed the blue-eyed Scott, who was promised a drinking contest at Nelson's apartment. Needless to say, he lost and was strangled with a necktie and stored under the floorboard. Yeah, that's a that's a tough loss. Yeah, you don't go strangling a tough Highlander loss. and throw him under the floorboard. I, oh, well, I would agree with that for sure. Um, in April, there were two more unidentified victims. The first one Nilsson referred to as Skinhead, and the second one he called Belfast Boy. When discussing these murders, he was quoted as saying, end of the day, end of the drink, end of a person. Floorboards back, carpet replaced, and back to work at Denmark Street. Jeez, what a psychopath. I mean, no emotion whatsoever. Just routine. He had a system down. He did it. <laughs> Ugh. In September of 1981, Nilsson met Malcolm Barlow, who was a drifter in London. Malcolm was an orphan with mental problems, and he was a pathological liar. When Malcolm was 11 years old, his mother died, and his sister was taking care of him. Unfortunately, he proved to be too much for her. He was unmanageable. He stole and would occasionally sleep with men and then try to blackmail them. Jeez. Yeah, poor guy. But you know what? That just goes to show what the mental health problem, you know, the mental health services, I'm sure, were not good either at that time. Mm. So one day, uh, Nilsson met 34-year-old Malcolm, who was having trouble outside Nilsson's apartment building. He told Nilsson that he didn't feel well, and he had epilepsy. Nilsson took him home and called him an ambulance, which took him to the hospital. Essentially, Nilsson saved his life, okay? So when Barlow gets out of the hospital, he wants to thank Nilsson. So he went back to his house to do just that. Oh, my God. Nilsson was at work, so Barlow, the idiot, waited on his doorstep for him to get home. And when Nilsson came home, he invited Barlow in, of course. They drank some rum together, and Barlow fell into a deep sleep. But Nilsson didn't like him. He found him a nuisance, so he strangled him. Okay, so he didn't sit around and talk about his day with him and, you know, kiss him on the lips or bathe him. He just shoved him under the kitchen sink. Okay. That is what happened. Alrighty then. Barlow joined a number of other deceased house guests of Nilsson's. Barlow was the last victim to die in the Melrose Avenue house. But Nilsson continued his killing spree at his new address, an attic flat in Cranley Gardens, So, because he had to move. Mm. But before moving, Nilsson had to dispose of the bodies that littered his house. He dug them up from the floorboards, chopped them up on the kitchen floor, and burned them in the backyard. Nilsson noted that the bodies beneath the floorboards seemed to attract insects, and they smelled bad. They created a very foul odor. They were covered in pupae. And infested with maggots. Some of the victims' heads had maggots crawling out of the eye sockets and their mouth. He would place deodorants beneath the floorboards and sprayed insecticide around his apartment twice a day. But the odor of decay and the presence of flies remained. Ew. I mean, what are you going to do, Jen? <sighs> it seems like he tried to do everything. Like I mean, he tried to be a good housekeeper with <laughs> decaying bodies in his floorboards. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's really up to that challenge. I think that might be the even the biggest challenge for, I don't know, Martha Stewart. That might be. Yeah, it would. That could be another good reality show. Maybe we could interview Martha Stewart sometime. Yeah. Martha, how would you hide the stench of a dead body? But asking for a friend. I mean. God. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know how he, on some level, okay, I know that he's rational and logical, but on some level, he has to be, I don't even know how you think that's possible. I just don't even know. I don't know. He's, it's just, yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah. It is unbelievable. Uh, it's just unbelievable. So when the bonfire had been reduced to ashes and cinders, Nilsson used a rake to sift through the dirt and debris for any bones that were still recognizable. 
He found a skull that was still intact, so he smashed it to pieces with the rake. In October 1981, Nilsen moved from 195 Melrose Avenue to 23D Cranley Gardens in the Muswell Hill District in North London. When Nilsen lived at Melrose Avenue, he was on the ground floor and had easy access to the backyard. But at Cranley Gardens, he was on the top floor apartment, so he had no access to a backyard. And because he was on the top floor, he couldn't store the bodies beneath the floorboard. For almost two months after he moved, any would-be lovers that Nilsen managed to talk into going to his apartment were not assaulted. He clearly just yes, had to kind of think right. out how he was going to dispose of it. Well, mostly anyway. He did attempt to strangle 19-year-old Paul Nobbs, but stopped himself from finishing the act. It wouldn't be until March of 1982 that he would kill again. And I wonder, Jen, like what you said, maybe he stopped himself because he hadn't quite thought through the disposal process yet. That very well could be. Mm -hmm. He might have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a 23-year-old man named John. And hmm? maybe Nelson felt the planet was a better place for having a guy named Nobbs on it. Just my two cents. That very <laughs> well could be. Agreed. 100%. Yeah. I'm just saying. I have some things going on in my head, but I'm just going to. I know. Okay. A 23-year-old man named John Howlett met Nilsson at a pub near Leicester. Leicester? You think of Leicester? I, yes. <laughs> Thank you for affirming yes. that, even if you don't know. I appreciate it. Leicester Square. Nilsson thought they might have a better time at his apartment. Of course. So he and Howlett continued drinking there. He put in a movie. They drank, drank, and drank. John moved to the front room of the flat and fell asleep on the bed and sat on the bed beside him for an hour, drinking rum and contemplating whether or not to kill him. <laughs> he finally decided, oh, what the hell, mm -hmm. and went for it. He strangled Howlett, who then woke up and fought Nilsson. I can imagine these two drunk guys. Yeah. Fighting each other. Do you suppose there was a lot of slapping going on? Well, like, you know, cat fighting. Well, yes. I don't know. Cause, because I'm, I'm assuming that Nilsson would kept trying to get his hands around Howlett's neck. Okay. So Howlett was actually able to strangle Nilsson as well. And he put up a totally ferocious fight. He did. Unfortunately, Nilsson got the upper hand on Howlett. He strangled him with an upholstery strap before returning to his living room. He noted that he was shaking from the, quote, stress of the struggle, end quote, because he thought he was going to lose. Over the next 10 minutes, John Howlett would revive and be strangled to unconsciousness three more times before Nilsson decided to fill up his bathtub and just drown him. For over a week after mm. the murder, Nilsson's neck was marked with John Howlett's finger marks. Because that's how, that's how strong oh John God. got him back, right? Yeah. Ugh. Poor guy. This is why I generally avoid getting drunk with strangers. Like, I'll go to their house and hang out and listen to Anne Murray right. all the time. But yeah. I generally stop after four or five margaritas or daiquiris and say, look, I need to keep my strength up so I can strangle you if you try and strangle me. And I know that you don't bring the nipple tassels out, only on special occasions. Only on special occasions. Because I think that can rev up like, people. Right now as we're recording this, it's 4th of July today, so I've already got my tassels know, on. Right? You are ready to go. And they're a little jangly this year. I can hear them dingling like little cat collars. They are. And they're blue and sparkly. You're the best. You're coordinating it with your sparkly blue headband. I love that. I am. I am. It's fantastic. <clears throat> All right. In May of 1982, Nilsson met a 21-year-old gay man named Carl Stodder. Carl was upset about a bad relationship he'd just gotten out of and was drinking at the Black Cap Pub in Camden. This is where he met Nelson. Being the ever-concerned, always helpful man about town, Nelson was only too pleased to be a shoulder for Carl to cry on. Well, he's a helpful dude. I mean, I think we've seen that all throughout. He is helpful. So... He's he is. He's a giver. They went back to Nilsson's apartment and started drinking. Carl believes that he was drugged because all he remembers are bits and pieces of what happened that night. They had been drinking and Stodder fell asleep on an open sleeping bag. Dennis had warned him when he laid down to be careful of the zipper because it can stick. 
And so he like said, you know, hey, be careful, don't get caught in the zipper. And then Carl, you know, fell asleep or passed out, drunk, whatever. That's so weird. I wonder, you know, it's kind of like, hey, if you get tired, I want you just to kind of lay on this plastic tarp right. beside this big nun. Right. Just lay right over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good Lord. Well, later on, Stodder woke up to being strangled with Nilsson saying, stay still. Stodder thought Nilsson was trying to free him from the zipper of the sleeping bag. He drifted into unconsciousness again, and he woke up a bit later to running water and then realized that Nilsson was trying to drown him. He was able to get his head out of the water long enough to say, no more, please, no more, before Nilsson submerged him again. So he had killed again. He put Stodder's body in an armchair where his dog, Bleep, started licking Stodder's face. Ah. Uh-huh. But wait, what was this? Stodder seemed to have a glimmer of life left in him after all. Nilsson rubbed Stodder's limbs and heart to increase circulation and covered him in blankets. He then put him on his bed. When Stodder woke up again, Nilsson hugged him tightly and explained to him how he almost strangled himself on the zipper of the sleeping bag and that he, Nilsson, had saved him. He was a hero. Oh my God. Over the next two days, Stodder repeatedly came in and out of consciousness. When he regained enough strength to question Nilsson as to what happened with the strangling and waking up under cold water, Nilsson said that Stodder had simply become caught in the zipper of the sleeping bag after a nightmare. Nilsson quickly placed him in the tub of cold water because he was in shock. Nilsson then let Stodder go. He took him to a nearby railway station and told him they hoped they might meet again someday. Yeah. <coughs> That's fine. How do you do? I'm going to try to kill you about seven times, revive you, and then let you go and say, hey, let's that meet up time. again sometime. So during that, after the strangling and the drowning, was he drugging him or strangling him over and over again? Or do we know? I don't. It's not very clear. Um and there is actually a really good interview on YouTube with Carl Stodder, who's actually passed away now, unfortunately. This this completely ruined his life, um, as you can imagine. The trauma sure from this and, and and then into his extended family, his nephew actually committed suicide because he his nephew got so depressed and he said – he told his mom, I don't want you to have to go through with me what you went through with Uncle Carl. Um yeah. I mean, this guy could have had a family, you know, uh, he could have had children. He, I mean, he, yes, he was gay, but he, so he could have adopted children. He could have had a family. He could have had a wonderful, beautiful life. And this guy just totally, completely hundred percent destroyed it. And then the domino effect on and on. But yes, he, he believes that he was being drugged, but he, but he would also, he said in, in one of the documentaries, because there's several of them on YouTube, several interviews, um, he said in one of them that, you know, he just kept reviving him, like he'd kill him or, or get him to the brink of death and then revive him. It was just the weirdest thing. So it was hard for Carl to really piece together if he was coming out of just being strangled or coming out of like a drug induced sleep, something. So it was... Mm. really difficult. And I don't know if he got medical treatment right away. I don't think that he did. So I'm sure a toxicology report was not ran on him. Oh, I'm sure not. Yeah. I'm sure Cause not. I think he was just probably Jesus. too afraid to even, you know, do anything about it. Just probably terrified. So yeah, very, very sad. Very sad. Um, in June, things were looking up for Nilsson. He got a promotion. He was promoted to executive officer at his civil service position. And this is the job where he helped people find jobs. Again, Jen, mm-hmm. very helpful person. We do. Yes. We see this time and again. Yep. Well, about three months after his promotion, Nilsson met 27-year-old Graham Allen who was trying to catch a taxi. And Nilsson offered Mr. Allen a meal at his home at Cranley Gardens. There, Mr. Allen ate an omelet, and Nilsson strangled him from behind. 
He then kept Alan's body in a bathtub for three days before he moved him to the kitchen floor and began to dissect him. He had to miss work the next day in order to finish the job. Is this the first dissection or the first um, full murder in this new location? Yes. I, uh, it's going to be the second. It's the second, second. one. Okay. Mm-hmm. The first okay. one was Howlett. Call it right. Okay, mm-hmm. gotcha. Yeah, and th- so he had to miss work after killing Howlett as well, and the reason is is because he didn't have that bottom floor apartment where he could just stuff them in the mm-hmm. floorboards and wait till later because he wouldn't dissect them right away. He'd just put them in the floorboards and get them out as he pleased, and then he could do the bonfire in the back, and it was a very nice setup. But then his landlord wanted to redecorate, and he got him to move to this attic apartment which he really didn't think through because it was a top floor so um so yeah so now he's having to miss work because he's got to chop the bodies up right away because he can't stick them below the floorboards yeah so on january 26 1983 20 year old stephen sinclair became nilson's final victim At Nilsen's apartment, Sinclair fell into a drug and alcohol-induced sleep in an armchair while Nilsen sat listening to the rock opera Tommy. Nilsen knelt down in front of Stephen and said to himself, Oh, Stephen, here I go again. Then he strangled him with a necktie and a rope. Nilsen noticed that Stephen had crepe bandages on each of his wrists He removed these and uh, found some deep slash marks where Stephen had recently tried to kill himself. After bathing the body, Nilsen laid it on his bed, showered it with talcum powder for freshness, of course, and arranged three mirrors around the bed. Oh, Jesus. He got undressed and laid next to the body for several hours. At one point, he turned Stephen's head toward him, kissed it, and said, Good night, Stephen. And then he fell asleep. I mean, that's almost creepier than just having sex with it. Oh, Jesus. You know? I mean, Mm. I just can't even. Okay, so sometime later, Nilsen dissected Sinclair's body, just like the others, with parts wrapped in plastic bags and stored either in a wardrobe, a tea chest, or within a drawer located beneath the bathtub. I don't know who has drawers beneath the bathtub, but apparently in London they do. Nilsen thought it would be a great idea to, once dissected small enough, flush bone and flesh down the toilet. He also boiled the heads, hands, and feet to remove flesh off these sections of the victim's bodies. For easier disposal, of course. Mm. Most sources say that someone called about block drains at Cranley Gardens. Wikipedia states that on February 4th, 1983, Nilsen wrote a letter of complaint to a state agent complaining that the drains at Cranley Gardens were blocked and that the situation for himself and other tenants was intolerable. So Nilsen wrote, uh, <laughs> moron. <laughs> So not only did he clog the gardens or the drains, but he told on himself that he clogged the drains. Mm. And when you think, okay, maybe I'm the one doing it since I'm flushing human body parts down here. I don't know. I just didn't get that arm chopped up small enough, apparently. Yeah. I mean, the irony there, right? I just, isn't there an award for a stupid criminal? I know there's a Darwin Awards for stupid death, but there's got to be an award for stupid criminals. (laughs) And that's why I said he was, right? That's why I said he was really, really good at being a serial killer until he wasn't. Because he was Mm -hmm. really good at it. And then he just wasn't. Not anymore. Mm -mm. Moron. So, yeah. So, ask and ye shall receive. On February 8th, 1983, Michael Catran, a dino rod employee, came to Cranley Gardens to inspect the drains. Opening a drain cover, Catran discovered flesh-like substances and numerous small bones of unknown origin. The drain was full of these substances, and Catran had suspicions that they were human. He said that they did not look like animal stuff. 
When his supervisor arrived at the site, it was already late and too dark to do much, so they postponed the work until the next morning. At 7.30 a.m. the following day, Michael Catran and his supervisor, Gary Wheeler, returned to Cranley Gardens to find the drain had been cleared. Well, this sent the warning flag sky high. Catran went digging in the drain to see if anything had been left behind. There had been. That's right, Jen. Apparently, Mr. Nilsson wasn't all that smart because he left something down probably probably up in a pipe or something scraps of flesh and four bones in a pipe leading from the drain which linked to the top flat of the house to both wheeler and katran the remains looked as though they were human they sent the specimens to pathologist david bowen and he advised that the remains were human one particular piece of flesh had been from a human neck that bore a ligature mark Detective Chief Inspector Peter J. and two of his colleagues thought they should wait outside Nelson's apartment building until he came home from work. When he did return home, DCI J. introduced himself and his colleagues, explaining that they needed to speak to him about his drains. The three officers followed Nelson into his flat, where they immediately noted the odor of rotting flesh. Nelson asked the police why they were so interested in his drains. The police told him that the blockage was caused by human remains. Well, Nelson was shocked and bewildered at this news. At least he acted shocked and bewildered, stating, good grief, how awful. DCIJ was not in the mood for games. Stop messing about, DCIJ said. Where's the rest of the body? Over, ah, over there. Over there. <laughs> how does a Scotsman sound? I don't know how to do a Scottish accent. I don't know. Over, Over there. there. I don't know. He pointed <laughs> to a wardrobe on the other side of the room. There were two plastic bags inside a wardrobe filled to the rim with body parts. The smell of rotting death was fierce. They arrested him on suspicion of murder. As they were driving to the police station... Detective Steve McCusker asked Nielsen. Are we talking about one body or two here? Ah, 15 or 16. 15 or 16. 15 or 16 bodies. This made the... Overall. This made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. DCIJ looked in the rearview mirror at Detective McCusker. And McCusker had to remind him to keep his eyes on the road because he was driving. McCusker could hear the steering wheel shaking from DCI Jay's fearful grip. Like he just started shaking so bad he was shaking the whole steering wheel. Because the guy said 15 or 16 bodies. Back at, no my God. Back at Nilsson's apartment when the officers arrived at the scene to investigate, they found a head in a pot on the stove. The skin almost completely boiled off. They found legs under a bench seat in the bathroom. They found internal organs in bags, not to mention the two garbage bags filled with body parts that were in the wardrobe. Meanwhile, back at the station, Nilsson started talking and kept talking and wouldn't stop talking. He said he wanted it all out there. But if you listen to this guy talk, you know he doesn't give even a little bit of a fuck about confessing and clearing his conscience. He just loves to hear himself talk. Interestingly, he told them what would happen is he would go out, drink, bring someone home, drink some more, and when he would wake up, there was a dead body beside him. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in the blackout excuse. Well, oh, no. Minute. Oh, absolutely not. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. No. Yeah. He went into minute detail about what he did with the bodies. However, they still had to confirm that what he was telling them was the truth. He let the police know that there were only three or four bodies at Cranley Gardens. The rest of the bodies were at his previous address on Melrose Avenue, buried in the backyard. Officers were immediately sent over there on that dreary, gray, cold February day. They were given shovels and told to stop digging. Yeah. One of the officers stated that she found three bones within the first half hour. Once they got going, hundreds, thousands more were found. 
small fragments and larger pieces. How many people were buried back there? They were wondering. How many lost souls? The answer is beyond comprehension. Sometime later, Nilsson would reflect on his killing spree and state, Ach, I caused dreams. I caused dreams which caused death. This is my crime. I started down the avenue of death in possession of a new kind of flatmate. A dead, stinky one. Who I could kiss on the lips and lament when his penis fell off. And now I'm just talking like an evil sci-fi character. But that's what you get today. Because I don't feel good. Once you hit the go button, it's time, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to slow down that train. I I can't reel it back in. I can't take it back. It's okay. It's all right. You go, Scottish. You go. Most people put a flyer up in a grocery store or an ad in a newspaper in 1983, but Nilsson decided on a different approach. And I know that I don't need to read that in an accent, but I'm just going to because I feel like it. Oh, I think it's always lovely to talk in an accent. Some accents, you have to be careful because it'd be misappropriation now, wouldn't it? Well, I think since we're direct descendants of British people, that we're okay to mutilate their accents. Agreed. I think it's totally culturally appropriate. Agreed. Fantastic. All right. So the police interviewed Nilsson on 16 separate occasions over the following days. The interviews totaled over 30 hours. He was steadfast in his denial of knowing why he had done it, stating to the officers, I'm hoping you will tell me that. And yes, I know that wasn't Scottish. Mm -hmm. He said the decision to kill was made Mm -hmm. only moments before it happened. And I'm going to call bullshit on that one too, but whatever. (laughs) Sexually aroused by the dead bodies, but... He didn't have sex with them, stating that his victims were too perfect and beautiful for the pathetic ritual of commonplace sex. Also, I imagine things were a little soupy and it would be hard to, you know, once you puncture something, it's going to leak all over. I see what you're saying. Yeah, he said said, it it was kind of gross, so I didn't put it in, but I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, He said that he did try to have sex with one of the bodies. And I want to say it was after his first victim, little Stephen Holmes, the little 14 year old dude, but he couldn't stay aroused. And maybe that's why, because things weren't toy like a toy gun. I know that sounds really inappropriate. I'm just trying to be funny to take away from the seriousness of it. Um, so he did try, but he would do, um, he would have a little alone time with them either sit on them or sit beside them, pleasure himself near the body. But he didn't want to, he said that he just, he thought that they were too perfect and too pristine. And, and this, and that part of it makes it even more gross when we get into a little bit more about what he says in his reflection on the, the killings. It's just a little more, just a little more gross, just a little added depth to the grossness and disgustingness Mm -hmm. of his mind in just a little bit. We'll get to that. Okay. Well, after he killed them and bathed them, he would also shave off any chest hair, making them into his person of a man. He told police that he would then dress them in underwear and socks, and it was only when they were cleaned up and half naked that he would sit with them on his couch or his bed and talk or cuddle. Or huggle, as I like to say. It's a hug and a snuggle. Ew. Yeah. So Nelson would later write in his journal, quote, I could only relate to a dead image of a person I could love. The image of my dead grandfather would be the model of him at his most striking in my mind. It seems necessary for them to have been dead in order that I could express those feelings, which were feelings I held sacred for my grandfather. It was a pseudo-sexual infantile love, which had not yet developed and matured. The sight of them brought me a bitter sweetness and a temporary peace and fulfillment. What a douche. 
In a police interview on February 10th, Nilsson confessed the dismembered body parts were the bodies of three men, all usually with a necktie. One of them he could not name, the second one he called John the Guardsman, and the third he identified as Stephen Sinclair. He also further remains were throughout his apartment at Cranley Gardens. He said there was a skull, part of a torso, and various empty chest in his living room. And there was the lower section of a torso and two legs stowed in a bag in the bathroom. But it's behind my scale because my my thighs were getting a little chubby, so I I had to tuck it behind the scale so I could still weigh myself every day. And I think that his flat wasn't very big because it was an attic flat. Yes. So I think it was pretty. So there was a lot of stuff of body parts in in every nook and cranny in that place. Um, So John the Guardsman was actually John Howlett, the first one killed. Okay. There. And then Stephen Sinclair was the last one. So as the interviews continued, he confessed to the killings at Cranley Gardens and Melrose Avenue but he disclosed that there were about seven times that he was unsuccessful and the victims got away. In our research, we have found evidence of three such cases, Andrew Ho, Carl Stoddar, and Douglas Stewart. Oh, and Paul Knobs. I forgot about Paul Knobs. Paul Knobs, so that'd be four. These men showed unbelievable bravery in coming forward to testify against him. Oh, God. So, for a minute, he confessed... So why would there even be a trial? Why would these survivors have to be put through this? Well, they was crazy or if he knew exactly what he was doing. Remember, he told police that he blacked out and he didn't really remember strangling them. However, he would later write in his memoirs very descriptive details of the murder. Obviously, that was total bullshit. Yeah, for sure. So they have the confessions to 15 murders. Eight are definitively identified. Several he identified by nickname only. Some were all but forgotten in Nilsson's mind, which is, oh my God. I mean, if you're going to do something so as so intimate as to kill somebody, maybe, you know, know their name. I don't know. Do them that, do them that bit of respect. Mm. By English law, the police had 48 hours to officially charge him with murder or let him go. They were a bit frantic because they had to positively identify at least one of the victims before they could officially charge Nilsson. The thought was, what would happen if they charged this guy with murdering one of the named victims and then said named victim walks through the door? You know, I mean, they had to be sure because they had to be credible. I mean, if the, if this was all in his mind and all fantastical or even just half of it and they got it wrong then that would they would have a very tough time convicting him and here they had he had all these body parts in his apartment right so they wanted to make sure to get it right but they were under a under a timeline here of 48 hours to prove it my god man okay um they were able to identify one of the bodies as his last victim steven sinclair and they were able to officially charge Nilsson with murder. Nilsson was actually charged and transferred to Brixton Prison, where he would await trial. He felt he would be viewed as innocent until proven guilty, as was the law. He refused to wear a prison uniform. As a protest to what he interpreted as breaches of prison rules, Nilsson refused to wear any clothes and subsequently was not allowed to leave his cell. In August, Nilsson threw the contents of his chamber pot on several officers outside of his cell. He was charged and found guilty of assaulting police officers and spent 56 days in solitary confinement. Whew. Yeah. Mm. Little drama queen there, a little bit. Good. God. Mm-hmm. Nilsson's first appointed lawyer was yo-yoed around by Nilsson, meaning he would let him go, accept him back as his lawyer, and let him go again. He did that about three times. This lawyer, Moss, prepared Nilsson's full defense, but Nilsson ended up letting him go in the end. He was then represented by Ralph Hames. Hames advised Nilsson to plead not guilty by reason of diminished responsibility. 
The trial started on October 24th, 1983 at the Old Bailey Courthouse in London. He stood before Mr. Justice Croom Johnson and pleaded not guilty on all charges. Of course, he killed his victims, but that wasn't what was on trial here. His state of mind before and during the killings was what was on trial. Was he sane, in full control of his actions, or had he killed with premeditation? The defense counsel argued that Nilsson suffered from diminished responsibility, rendering him incapable of forming the intention to commit murder and therefore should only be convicted of manslaughter. DCIJ testified for the prosecution stating that Nilsson's demeanor after his arrest and during his confessions was calm, matter of fact. In one interview, he stated, I have no tears for my victims. I have no tears for myself or those bereaved by my actions. And he also stated in um, one of his uh, confession tapes, he, he just thought so highly of himself. And he thought that he was totally controlling the game, that he was confessing and no other serial killer had ever divulged or disclosed this much information and wasn't he I mean he was the only one so he is pretty he's a pretty big deal and they should be making a big deal about him and he's so helpful and you know he just kept stating over and over again no other serial killer has ever just sat down and said yes I did it and took responsibility like I am and given them all of the facts about the victims and the timeline and all of that, like I am doing. He was just mm-hmm. very, like, strutting his own stuff, tooting his own horn kind of a thing. He he just really thought a lot of himself, for sure. What a creep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, two psychiatrists testified on behalf of the defense. James McKeith testified as to how, through lack of emotional development, Nilsson experienced difficulty expressing any emotion other than anger and his tendency to treat other human beings as components of his fantasies. He also said that Nilsson possessed narcissistic traits, an impaired sense of identity, and was able to depersonalize other people. McKeith's conclusions were that Nilsson had an unspecified disorder which was severe enough to substantially reduce Nelson's responsibility. Yes. And the mm-hmm. second psychiatrist was Patrick Gelway. He diagnosed Nelson with a borderline false as if pseudo normal narcissistic personality disorder with occasional outbreaks of schizoid disturbances that Nelson managed to keep at bay most of the time. Good Lord, that's a mouth, right? My goodness sakes. I don't even know what all that means. Galway stated that when having an episode, Nilsson became predominantly schizoid, acting in an impulsive, violent, and sudden manner. He also said that someone suffering from these episodes is most likely to, quote, disintegrate under circumstances of social isolation. Which is a fancy way of saying that Nilsson was not guilty of malice aforethought. I'm calling bullshit. Because he picked these men up and took him back to his apartment or flat, knowing exactly how things were going to play out because it happened over and over and over again. I mm-hmm. call bullshit. Agreed. Galway said, stated that while Nilsson was intellectually aware of his actions, he stressed that due to his personality disorder, he did not appreciate the criminal nature of what he had done. He's quoted as saying, I knew it was wrong. I just don't know what all the fuss is about. Okay, so there you go. He knew it was wrong. So you're guilty, Mm -hmm. fucker. So to rebut what the defense team's psychiatrist said about Nilsson, the prosecution team called their own expert. Paul Bowden had the opportunity to interview Nilsson on 16 separate occasions, and he found Nilsson to be a manipulative person who had been capable of forming relationships, but had forced himself to objectify people. He further testified that he found no evidence of maladaptive behavior and that Nilsson suffered from no disorder of the mind. The case was sent to the jury on November 3rd, 1983. The following day, they returned with a majority verdict of guilty on six counts of murder and one attempted murder with a unanimous verdict of guilty in relation to the attempted murder of Nobbs. Nilsson was sentenced to life in prison with the recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. Oh my fucking God. 
This minimum sentence was replaced in 1994 with a whole life tariff, thank God, by Home Secretary Michael Howard. This ruling ensured that Nilsen would never be released from prison. This was a punishment that he willingly accepted. He never appealed either sentence. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank God. Nilsen spent the remainder of his life reading and writing. He was allowed to paint and compose music on a keyboard. He exchanged letters with pen pals. He was in workshop translating books into Braille. He sought legal avenues to challenge real and perceived abuses of prison rules by prison officers. And mm -hmm. this made him not very popular among the guards and wardens. He essentially became a pain in the ass. I think that the reason why he didn't appeal was because he really liked living there. You know what I mean? He had all this attention. He probably had some gay rendezvous, I would mm -hmm. assume. Um, you know, he, I, I would assume that he liked the attention. Oh, yeah. I'm sure he did. He also brought a complaint against the jail because the gay softcore porn magazines he subscribed to regularly had images removed before they got to him. So he had a hard time whacking off. These mm -hmm. images were of a more explicit nature. The case was dismissed because he could not establish that any breach of his human rights had occurred. Yeah. So you're not going to get explicit porn, dude. You killed 15 people. Mm -hmm. You don't get porn. Or at least the kind you want. Mm -hmm. On May 10th, 2018, Nilsson was taken to York Hospital complaining of severe stomach pains. He had a ruptured, a, he had a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, which was repaired although he suffered a blood clot as a complication of the surgery. Nilsson died on May 12th. An autopsy revealed that the immediate cause of Nilsson's death was pulmonary embolism and retroperitoneal hemorrhage. He was cremated in June of 2018. I should have given you that paragraph. I think they should have flushed him down the toilet. <laughs> right? <laughs> Boil him up a little bit. Flush him on I down. I think that they should have put his ashes in the sewer. I think that's what should have happened. Um, Agreed. Because what a creep. So let's talk for a minute about his reason for killing was. What do you think? Yeah, because do we think that it was, you know, because remember he here, he has, he's ostracized from society, from his family and everybody a little weird. He's a little eccentric. He's also gay and he knows he's gay and he's made to feel ashamed. Everybody was at that time if you were gay, right? Mm -hmm. Then his, the most important person in his life died when he was five. Nobody told him. They just said, here's your grandfather lying in a dining room table on a box. Here you go. He's off to a better place. He never said goodbye to you. You're never going to talk to him again. Well, so I don't deny that shitty things happened to him however shitty things happen to people all the time people's mm -hmm. we have nephews who were adopted into oh. our family who had mm -hmm. a shitty horrible start in life mm -hmm. they have not made a choice to be violent or troubled children in school or no no they're, they're wonderful wonderful people every everybody Love has them. shit that happens Everybody has issues, uh, has family dysfunction at one point or another, and the vast majority do not choose to uh, overpower others and uh, so oh, agreed. I think he deserved what he got. I think that he um, needed to be off. Um, and I think that that was really the only option because he was a fucktard. I oh, think he no. knew what he was doing. He knew the difference mm -hmm. between right and wrong. Do you think that there's some kind of a switch? So I have heard, and tell me if I'm wrong, that we all could have a cancer gene of some sort in us. It's just whether or not that cancer gene gets activated. Do you think, and I don't know if that's true or not, that's just mm -hmm. around the streets. Um, do you think that there is some kind of a serial killer gene or connection in the brain that due to either 
DNA, something inherited physically or environmental catalysts can send you down a certain path? Well, so they have, I watched a documentary not too long ago on psychopaths and the, cause that's uh, how we roll. Cause that's how we roll. <laughs> when we relax, psychopath documentary. <laughs> so one of the commentators said he had, they had done MRIs and they could, they could identify potential psychopath by the way a brain looked. And this normal man married kids had an MRI of his brain that looked like that was a psychopath brain, but because his upbringing, his environment or whatever, uh, was what it was, he was not, he didn't display those. Things. He had a normal loving relationship. He was able to have empathy right. and sympathy for people. And so, yeah, I do think that there is, you can have that abnormality in your brain, but whether or not in that direction is, you know, your, your environment does have something to do with that. Having uh -huh. said that, if you know right from wrong, murder, if you kill somebody, whether you're a psychopath or not. Agree. What? Oh, no, I don't think there's any question that he's guilty. I question that at all. I just like to find out why, you know, because. Oh, now I lost it. I interrupted myself and lost it. <laughs> say again is what there, you had said before is there a dimension here <laughs> if you know the difference between right and wrong whether you're a psychopath or not you're still guilty of murder she's thinking ladies and gentlemen it was really good too i had something very profound to say I'll remember it as we're doing the outro and then I'll suddenly shout it randomly is what's going to happen. I'm going to scare the crap out of you. Okay. So yeah, that's yeah. All right. Well, yes, I think okay. that he definitely is guilty. I think that he, um, definitely his environment played a part in it. Um, and I just think it's sad all around. I think it's, I, I agree. think it's just sad. I agree. And I think that there's some really fucked up parents, um, who, need to get a grip on life and need to take care of their kids in a loving way. Yeah. And by a loving way, I don't mean let them get away with everything either. I mean, you know, have a balance people. I agree. Yeah. So I all right. Agree with that. That's all I have. All right. <clears throat> well, we have given so much time to the murderer that we need to give a little bit of time to the victims. These are the lost boys of London, so to speak, who just wanted to be accepted, just wanted a bit of kindness, but instead found horror in their last moments of life. We're just going to list the names here of the known victims. Stephen Dean Holmes, age 14. Kenneth James Ockenden, age 23. Martin Brandon Duffy, age 16. William David Sutherland, aged 26. Malcolm Stanley Barlow, age 23. John Peter Howlett, aged 23. Archibald Graham Allen, age 27. Stephen Neal Sinclair, age 20. As interest in true crime has risen, documentaries and movies are being made all the time. A new BBC series called Deaths is now available for rent on Prime Video. It's a limited series. When this ran in the UK, it is reported that the public was almost smacked at the police's reaction to back in 1983. They could have stopped him several times if they had just taken an interest. But unfortunately, we have to remember it was a much different time a time of blatant bigotry and hatred toward things we don't understand. It's horrific and awful. And so these young men were turned out of their homes, traveled to London for a better life, only to have it come to a tragic end. 
It could all have been an Edgar Allan Poe poem, all of it. Well, this episode, this sad, mm, sad it's episode. It's a good one. Um, thanks everyone for listening. You make every so every episode awesome. We love doing this and love that you love listening. Jen, what do we have coming up next episode? So next episode is also in Britain. It's called uh, the Doddleston Papers um, and or the Doddleston Notes, I guess. And it's about maybe some messages that appear on a computer through time about 500 years ooh. Today, so oh yes interesting what's one movie with um dennis quaid and it takes place in like frequency you know what i'm talking about that's it frequency yes so this is really interesting uh and, and so we'll get into that next week i also want to take a minute to say that you can still win a lion planner. Uh, comment on our Facebook page. Uh, leave us a like. Like the lion planner page and we'll put you in a drawing for a planner. We've got our first winner and we will be reaching out through Facebook Messenger this week about that. And please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen because that helps us get up to the top of the um the choices when people are searching for paranormal podcasts uh that would be great we love that would help you. us out Please, a lot as always reach out to us with any suggestions criticisms or show ideas we want to hear from you we love to hear from you you can find us on facebook instagram and twitter and you can also email us at ichabod's house podcast at gmail.com it's actually ichabod's house pod at gmail.com <laughs> I meant that. It's Ichabod's house pod at gmail.com. Way to pay attention. Way to stay heads up. Tits up. I like that. Good job. It's the tassels. I have it to is the tassels. <laughs> work to keep them up. Until next time, everybody remember Ichabod loves you. Carry a flashlight and always bring extra pants.